All right, welcome back, emergency medical responder. This is chapter 10. Uh, this is medical emergencies. We're going to cover the topics that are relative to anything that the medical responder uh, might run into with the medical emergencies. All right, again, chapter 10, medical emergencies. Let's get started. All right, so general medical complaints may result from a wide variety of conditions. Common medical conditions include the following, angina pectoris, which is chest pain, heart attack, dyspnea, asthma, stroke, hypoglycemia, and diabetic coma, and also abdominal pain. Emergency medical responders or EMRs can prepare to treat medical patients by studying the signs and symptoms and treatments of each condition. So we're going to talk about those in this chapter and see if we can't make some clarity on this. All right, so patient assessment sequence. Remember, five components, folks, five components. First one, say it with me, scene size up. Next one, number two, primary assessment. Number three, history taking. Number four, secondary assessment. And number five, reassessment. Let us not forget these, okay? These are super, super, super important. This is what is the foundation of this program and your foundation of hopefully going from the first responder to the EMT and maybe paramedic one day. All right, so patient assessment in the medical emergency. First thing we're going to do is we're going to review the dispatch information to help you decide which problems are likely. Carefully assess the scene to identify pertinent safety issues for you and your patient. And then as you perform your primary assessment, first try to form a general impression of the patient's problem. We talked about this in the assessment module. Then determine the patient's responsiveness. Introduce yourself. Don't forget. Hi, I'm Jeff. I'm here to help you. What is your name? Can I help you? Check the patient's ABCs and acknowledge the patient's chief complaint. All right, so usually it's best to obtain a medical history on a patient uh, that are experiencing medical problems before you perform your secondary patient assessment. So following uh, the sample history, you want to get that information because it's going to help secure that very quickly. And the thing about getting the sample history is that if you don't get it initially, and the patient becomes unconscious, then you're going to miss out on an opportunity to get a lot of information. First one being signs and symptoms. What is their signs? Remember, that's anything that you can see, like a stop sign. Okay, and their symptoms. This is anything that they're going to tell you that's wrong with them. Next, you're going to ask them about the allergies, and that includes foods, that includes over-the-counter medicine, that includes allergies to seasonal type of allergies, and any medications, period, that they may uh, be allergic to. I always like the food one. Don't forget that. And then uh, next one is going to be your M, which is your medications. What medicines do you take? Both over-the-counter, non-over-the-counter, and also over uh, any kind of herbal supplements. And then the pertinent past medical history. This is the medical history that applies to the patient's condition. The last oral intake. What was the last time I had something to eat? And what was it? Okay. And then finally, E, that's the events associated with that was leading up to the illness or the injury. Then obtain the patient's vital signs and perform your ongoing assessment, which is our patient monitoring. If the arrival of additional medical services personnel is delayed, you're going to continue this assessment. Okay? Remember, you also need to be reassuring this patient. Make them comfortable. You're in their territory. You're in their turf. You're in their world, could you say. So you need to have that good relationship with them so that you'll be able to, to make them comfortable and make them assured that you're there to help them. All right, so general medical conditions. All right, so general medical conditions may have different causes, yet they result in similar signs and symptoms. Learn to recognize the signs and symptoms as well as the general treatment guidelines so you can provide immediate care. Initial treatment can stabilize the patient until other EMS and hospital personnel can take over. So you're going to get started on this person. You're going to help them first until the ambulance arrives or the fire department arrives. So you're going to be the first one to meet the patient. 
And so altered mental status. Altered mental status is a sudden and gradual decrease of a patient's level of responsiveness. responsiveness. To assess this condition, we talked about APU, the APU scale. All right, so let's get a little bit more in detail to it. Awake and alert. An alert patient will answer simple questions accurately and appropriately. Responsive to verbal stimuli means a patient who is responsive to verbal stimuli, and usually they will react to loud noises. And then the next one, responsive to pain. This is a patient who is responsible to a painful stimuli and will react to the pain by moving or crying out. And then finally, unresponsive. This is an unresponsive patient. They won't respond to either verbal or painful stimuli. All right, so when assessing the patient's mental status, consider two factors, the patient's initial level of consciousness and any change in that level of consciousness. I always like to tell folks, remember, especially if you're dealing with the elderly patient, you need to ask the caregiver or whoever there, maybe a family member, that kind of thing, and say, is this the normal level of consciousness for this person? Or is there some changes in their level of consciousness based on their past medical history? So make sure you get that level of normality as well. Conditions causing, causing an altered level of consciousness could be a head injury. Bumped on the head, they could have an intracerebral bleed, they could have concussion, those kind of things, and it can cause different states of altered mental status. Same thing with shock or decreased levels of oxygen to the brain, stroke, a slow heart rate, or even a high fever. Right, so conditions causing an altered level, you know, continued infections, that's a big one, urinary tract infections. We see a lot of elderly folks or people that are bedridden that have uh, catheterizations that are in their urinary system so that it can collect their urine. They end up getting, um, you know, urinary tract infections. Also poisonings and any time that their glu blood glucose, if they're a diabetic and their glucose gets low, it causes altered mental status. And then on just the opposite side, another cause of it where it causes their sugar to be low would be an insulin reaction. They've taken their insulin, but they did not eat. So now all that sugar that was in their blood is now going away. Okay, it's being transported elsewhere. And then finally, a psychiatric condition. All right, so initial treatments. You know, we need to maintain the patient's ABCs and normal temperature. You need to make sure you keep their airway, breathing, and circulation good. That's part of our primary survey, right? And make sure that they stay warm, okay? Pay, keep the patient from doing additional harm. I mean, our creed in emergency medicine is to do no harm, okay? That's what we, that's our mission. That's our creed. That's our, our standard, okay? If the patient is unconscious and has not sustained trauma, place the patient in a recovery position or use some kind of airway adjunct like a nasal pharyngeal airway or, uh, or an oral pharyngeal airway and always be prepared to suction. Seizures. All right, seizures are caused by sudden episodes of uncontrolled electrical impulses by the brain. General seizures usually produce kind of a shaking kind of movement and sometimes will involve the entire body. These seizures usually last one to two minutes and they go away. Although prolonged seizures may continue for more than two minutes. Patients are usually unconscious during generalized seizures and do not remember them afterwards. Although seizures are rarely life-threatening, they are a serious medical emergency and can be the sign of a life-threatening condition. So keep that in mind. These generalized seizures, um, they're usually caused, uh, one, of the, one of the causes is uh, high fever. These seizures are called febrile seizures. They occur most commonly in infants and young children. Uh, some seizures only result in a brief lapse of consciousness. These seizures are called absent seizures. Patients may blink their eyes, you know, they may stare, stare out in space uh, or jerk one part of their body. You must monitor the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation and arrange for transport. Since we don't know the cause of the seizures, you know, patients that are having neurological disturbances, you know, based on seizure activity, they need to go see a doctor. We are doctors, okay? So, you know, we might be one day if you keep going to school, but right now we're in the field. We don't have equipment. We don't have 
the labs. We don't have all the wonderful machines and things like that. We need to take them to the hospital. Seizures specifically can be caused by many factors to include any of these, epilepsy, trauma, head injury, stroke, or even shock. It can also be caused by a decreased level of oxygen to the brain, high fever, infection, poisoning, overdose of drugs or alcohol, a brain tumor. Okay, this is something that would be kind of long term or a brain infection. And then diabetic emergencies, emergencies and also sometimes complications of pregnancy. We call that eclampsia. Okay, they're preeclamptic when they're high blood, when they have really high blood pressure that's reactive to it. And then usually when they go into eclampsia, they have seizures. And that's definitely an emergency for both mom and also the baby as well. All right, so treatment, usually the seizure, okay, will be over by the time you arrive on the scene. If it is not ended, okay, when you get there, your treatment should focus on protecting the patient from injury. The patient should be moved only if he or she is in a dangerous location. You cannot do anything as an EMR about the patient's airway during the seizure. They are going to be actively seizing. Once the seizure has stopped, it's essential that you ensure an open airway. This is usually best by accomplishing using the head tilt chin lift maneuver. After you have opened the airway, place the patient in a recovery position. Number one goal while a patient is having seizures is to protect them. Protect them from further injury. Roll them to the side because that will help to keep the airway open. If you can ride that seizure out with them, that is just beautiful. That is not a problem. Um, but really, ultimately, what we have to do is wait till the seizure ends. All right, continue on. If the patient does not resume breathing, begin mouth to mouth um, or mouth to mass breathing. Administer supplemental oxygen as soon as it's available. And then after the seizure, move the patient to a more comfortable private place. There's nothing worse for a patient that's coming out of seizure activity and they're, in stand, they're laying in the middle of a crowd. Get the crowd away. Get the patient out of there if possible. It, they go into what's called a postictal state, which is right after the seizure. And it's confusing. They don't know what's going on. They, they can be very much so adamant and sometimes even a little upset or violent. So be very careful with that. All right, specific medical conditions. You will find it helpful to be knowledgeable about some of the more specific medical conditions you may encounter as an EMR. This information will help you to assess, treat, and communicate more effectively with patients who have medical conditions. <clears throat> All right, heart conditions. The heart must receive a constant supply of oxygen or it will die. The heart receives oxygen through a complex system of what we call coronary arteries, okay? Coronary arteries, as they get older and maybe you know, not so good of a diet, they may narrow as a result of atherosclerosis. That's what we call it, atherosclerosis. This disease is a process that causes layers of fat to coat the inner walls of the arteries. Progressive atherosclerosis can cause what we call angina pectoris. Remember, we talked about that earlier, a heart attack or even cardiac arrest. All right, so let's talk about angina peccatoris, right? All right, very good. This is chest pain, uh, plain and simply. It's caused by an inadequate blood flow uh, and therefore inadequate amount of oxygen to the heart muscle. Your heart wants oxygen. It needs oxygen. It's got to have it. And when it's robbed of oxygen, it lets you know about it. It makes your heart go, oh, oh, my killing me. I'm, <laughs> I'm in chest pain. That's exactly what angina is. And angina is often described as pressure or heavy discomfort, like there's an elephant sitting on my chest kind of thing. Angina attacks are usually brought on by exertion, emotion, or eating. A lot of common exertion, they're out mowing the grass or they're outside exercise and that kind of thing, or they get very upset. Uh, crushing pain may be felt in the chest sometimes with this and may radiate to either both arms, the neck, the jaw, or any combination of these sites. The patient is often short of breath and sweating and is extremely frightened and has a sense of doom. Okay, they're always thinking, oh my God, I'm having the big one. Uh, I'm going to the hospital. They're gonna stick needles in me. I may die, I may end up in surgery. They start, you know, absolutely going crazy with all these things that could happen to them. When in fact, if we just, you know, calm them down and start treating their angina and get them to calm down, some of that will go away. 
And more than likely, you know, if they don't have this before, and if they, they haven't been diagnosed this before, they're going to have to go to the hospital to be examined and treated for it. Sometimes they have nitroglycerin, and we can treat them with the nitroglycerin if they haven't already started it. Uh, we can encourage them to begin to take their nitroglycerin. All right, so ask if the patient has already been treated for that heart condition and has nitroglycerin. I mean, this, this can happen. Nitroglycerin usually relieves angina pain. If the patient has been prescribed nitroglycerin, you can assist the patient in taking one pill or administering the aerosol spray. If the pain has not lessened in five minutes after the first dose, help the patient take another, okay? If the pain has still not lessened five minutes after the second dose, assume that the patient is having a heart attack. And, you know, this patient needs to be transported to the hospital. So make sure that we've got EMS on the way. Anytime you're working with somebody with chest pain, let's go ahead and get EMS on the way because at least we can get some good vital signs and all that kind of good stuff. This is way outside of what an EMR should, should actually be doing and then releasing, you know, after they've taken a couple of doses of uh, nitroglycerin. Always follow your local protocols regarding the administration of nitroglycerin. So whatever your department policy is when you start working as a EMR, you know, in a system, uh, hopefully to move on up into EMT, make sure you follow those protocols. All right, heart attack or an acute myocardial infarction or what we also refer to as acute coronary syndrome. Heart attack, which is myocardial infarction, results in one or more of the coronary arteries getting completely blocked, okay? The two primary causes of coronary artery blockage are severe atherosclerosis and a blood clot from somewhere else in the circulatory system that breaks free and becomes lost in that artery. Okay, this is what we were talking about earlier. Let's take a look at this. See this, this area right here? This area right here, this is that plaque formation, that atherosclerosis that we were talking about earlier. This is the artery itself, okay? Here's the little guy right here. See, there's multiple coronary arteries. See these guys? There are multiple coronary arteries, and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. But what happens is that when this clot happens, okay, the coronary artery blockage, everything from there down, all right, there down, does not get any oxygen so the heart muscle begins to die and it says owie and it lets you know about it you know it's it's blocked and it's not happy okay it's very angry at this point so it's going to tell you about it and hopefully we can get this restored as quickly as possible by getting into the hospital all right so signs of the heart attack include the patient suffers immediate or severe pain the pain may radiate from the chest to the left arm or to the jaw or to the back. The patient is usually short of breath, weak and sweating and nauseated, may vomit. The blocked area is, is critical or large. The heart may actually even stop completely. Okay, so you may have somebody that goes into cardiac arrest. Sounds familiar on the signs and symptoms, right? Kind of sounds like angina. The difference is with angina and versus the heart attack is that the heart attack usually just comes on you know suddenly no but the person's not doing anything they're not out mowing the grass you know they're not uh, emotionally stressed I mean it just happens because the clot it blocks up that artery and that's the end of that uh, so that's a good indicator and the pain does not go away uh, even if they have nitroglycerin usually the pain does not go away this is a very severe type of condition which patients could die from all right, so complete sensation of the heartbeat is what we call cardiac arrest. Okay, that's when cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, that we talked about in Chapter 9 comes into place. So take the following actions. Call for help. You know, talk to the patient to relieve his or her anxiety. Uh, touch the patient and establish a bond. Reassure that patient. We're hopefully we're not getting into you know cardiac arrest. Hopefully they don't go into cardiac arrest. But the more that you calm and reassure the patient, the more confidence that they're going to have in your abilities, and it'll help them to calm down quite a bit. All right, so we're going to continue on. We're going to move the patient as little as possible and don't allow them to move. Okay, place the patient in the most comfortable position. Usually this is in a semi-reclining or a sitting position. 
Help the patient take one adult aspirin, that's 325 milligrams, or two to four low-dose aspirin, which is 81 milligrams each. You ask why. And again, this is all based on your protocol and based on what you've been instructed to do. What happens is that the aspirin is a anticoagulant medication. So you're actually helping to maybe loosen up that blockage so it'll free itself. Now, if the pain goes away because you gave aspirin, <laughs> it doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have, that does not have to go to the hospital. They need to still go to the hospital. And then if you have oxygen, administer it, okay, if it's available and protocols permit. Be prepared to administer cardiopulmonary resuscitation if necessary, and if an automated external uh, AED is available, have it brought to the patient and make sure it's ready to be used if needed. Your primary role is to provide emotional support and arrange for prompt transport to an appropriate medical facility. All right, congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure, or CHF, is caused by a failure of the heart to pump adequately. If one side of the heart becomes weak and cannot pump as well as the other side, the circulatory system becomes unbalanced. This results in circulatory congestion. In congestive heart failure, the failure is in the heart muscle, but the congestion is in the blood vessels. So here's your figure here, all right? It shows A and it shows B. A is a normal exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the capillary and the alveoli. In B, when you have congestive heart failure, you end up with pulmonary edema. That congestive heart failure causes fluid to leak from the capillaries and build up in the alveoli. And what happens is impending and oxygen and carbon dioxide exchanges are impaired. So you can see, okay, fluid starts pushing into the alveoli. When the back pressure builds up, it just, it just is going to happen. The, the fluid is going to cross that membrane and get in the alveoli. Therefore, you can actually hear bubbling while they're breathing because there's fluid that's in their lungs. It's very easy to hear. Uh, sometimes you can even hear it with the audible ear. You don't need a stethoscope. All right, so signs and symptoms usually the, have difficulty breathing. That's their major symptom. Rapid shallow breathing, moist or gurgling rep respirations, profuse sweating. They have enlarged neck veins. could be swollen, could be sticking up. Swollen ankles and then anxiety. Take these actions. As soon as you determine that a patient is experiencing congestive heart failure, you need to do a couple of things. Place the patient in a sitting position with the legs down to drain some of the fluid back into the lower parts of the body. So sitting with their legs dangling, okay? Administer oxygen in large quantity and at a high flow rate if protocols permit and you're trained to use it. And then of course you need to summon for additional help. You need to make sure you get 911 coming. Uh, arrange for a prompt transport to the appropriate medical facility. Dyspnea, fancy word for shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. This is usually associated with some serious heart or lung disease that the patient's already experiencing. Heart-related causes include angina pectoris, heart attack, and also congestive heart failure. Pulmonary diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, pneumonia, and asthma also can cause dyspnea. COPD and emphysema are caused by damage to the small sacs of the alveoli, those little small bubbles in there that are in the lungs. Chronic bronchitis is caused by an inflammation of the airways in the lungs, and both of these are usually associated with smokers or somebody who's had some kind of lung tissue disease or some lung tissue type of injury. Now, pneumonia is caused by an infection in the lungs, and then asthma is caused by a clamping down or spasms of the smaller airway passages. Don't spend too much time trying to determine the specific cause of shortness of breath, but rather focus on treating the symptoms. All right, some general treatment. Check the patient's airway to be sure it's not obstructed. Check the rate and depth of the breathing. Place the patient in a comfortable position, whatever works for them. I mean, whatever makes them comfortable is what's important. And provide them with reassurance. Tell them that, you know, the ambulance is on the way, fire department's on the way, whatever the case may be in your situation, that somebody's on their way. 
and anything that's tight around the chest, around the abdomen, loosen it up, make it more comfortable for them. And if you have oxygen, go ahead and administer the oxygen. All right, so with asthma, asthma, like I mentioned earlier, is an acute spasm of the you know, air passages associated with excessive mucus production and swelling in the lining of the respiratory passages. Asthma can be caused by an allergic reaction, severe emotional stress, uh, exercise, and respiratory infections. Asthma attacks kill about 3,630 uh, people in the United States. That happened in 2013. Uh, patients experiencing an asthma attack will have a great difficulty exhaling through their partially, obst partially obstructed air passages. A wee sound will be heard on exhalation. So when the air comes out, you'll, have, you'll hear a wheezing sound. Many patients will have taken medications before your arrival, uh, and you need to know that patients can die during asthma attacks. Following the, tr uh, following the treatment steps for shortness of breath and instruct the patient to perform purslet breathing is about the only things you can do. Purslet breathing releases some of the internal lung pressures that are caused by asthma attacks. Just have the that's purse lips, they squeeze their lips together, okay? Uh, if advanced life support is not available, arrange for prop transport to an appropriate medical facility. They need to get to a hospital. Okay, this, this is serious business. If, they're, if they have their own medications, you can assist them with taking their own medications, but uh, they need to go to a hospital. Okay, this, can be, this can be deadly if not treated. Stroke. All right. With stroke, it is the leading cause of brain injury and disability in adults. Most strokes are caused by a blood clot, not a bleed, a blood clot that blocks blood supply to the part of the brain. Okay. Signs and symptoms vary depending on which portion of the brain is affected, but they include headache, numbness or paralysis on one side of the body, dizziness, and also confusion. Here's some additional signs and symptoms, drooling, inability to speak, difficulty seeing, unequal pupil size, unconsciousness, seizures, respiratory arrest, incontinence, and also uh, patients that are unresponsive. Uh, they can also have seizures, they can have respiratory arrest. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could happen to them um, that could be related to the, to the stroke itself. All right, so Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. It is an easy to administer and accurate tool that you can use to determine whether a patient may have experienced a stroke. It requires no special equipment. It consists of three assessments. The first one, assessment of facial muscles by having the patient smile. Is there any drooping? Uh, thing? Is there anything that's unusual about it? Assessment of arm drift by having the patient hold her arms, his or her arms out in front of the body. So if they hold their arms and they can't hold one of them up, especially if it's on the same side of the droop, then that's positive. Now remember, any one of these assessments, you know, requires no special equipment. Any one of these assessments that are positive, then it's a positive Cincinnati stroke scale. And they need to go to a stroke center. And then finally, the last part of the stroke scale is speech. Have them say something simple. The sky is very blue today. Okay. Then that's pretty positive to me. Or you can't teach old dogs new tricks. I have a hard time saying that one myself. But anyhow, if the patient cannot complete one or more of these tasks, you need to suspect a stroke. Here is the uh, table 10-1 that's in your book. And it explains the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. Take a look at that. Treatment. The first priority is to maintain an open airway. Administer oxygen using a non-rebreathing face mask if it's available and you are trained to use it. If the patient is having a seizure, try to prevent further injury from occurring. Be prepared to administer rescue breathing if the patient stops breathing. All right. Also, place the unresponsive patient in a recovery position. Provide emotional support by talking to and touching the patient. Some patients can be treated with drugs to dissolve the blood clot in their brain. And you need to arrange for that prompt transport so they can get to that stroke center uh, so that they can get treated. So that's the biggest thing. Give emotional support, 
you know, try to be as positive as you can and make sure that you get transport uh, arranged very quickly. All right, diabetes. Okay, diabetes is caused by the body's inability to process and use glucose, which is sugar, which is carried by the bloodstream uh, to all the body cells. Our cells have to have glucose in order to work. Otherwise, they don't work. It's, it's, it's what creates the energy. Boom, you know, it feeds the energy and makes the spark happen, okay? The body's cells need both oxygen and glucose to survive, period. Body produces a hormone called insulin that enables the glucose to be carried by the blood or carried by the blood to move into the individual cells where it is used for fuel. Insulin does not make glucose and it does not destroy it. It carries it around. It's a transporter. It puts a little glucose uh, sugar molecule on their back and takes it to the cell where it needs to be, where that cell is going to use it as fuel. If the body does not produce enough insulin, the cells become starved for glucose and diabetes results. Does everybody understand that? That's pretty simple. If we don't produce enough glucose, okay, the cells become starved because there's nobody bringing it to them. They can't go out and get it themselves. It's not like they can go down to the grocery store or the convenience store. Give me a bag of sugar. Nope, it does not work that way. Somebody has to bring it to them. So that's what's important. And if they don't bring it to them, then they're going to starve. Many diabetics must take supplemental insulin injections to support that whole process. Okay, so that's how it works. You know, we can eat as much as we want and put all that sugar in us. But if we don't have the insulin to take it or transport it to the cells, cells are going to starve. They're not going to work. All right. So hypoglycemia, diabetes is a serious medical condition. There's two specific medical conditions that can, that can occur in conjunction with it, uh, hypoglycemia and diabetic coma. So hypoglycemia, it occurs if the body has enough insulin, but not enough blood glucose. So it's got enough insulin, but not enough blood glucose. An older term for hypoglycemia is also called insulin shock. Signs and symptoms include pale, moist, cool skin, rapid, weak pulse, dizziness or headache, confusion or unconsciousness, and sweating. All right, so hunger as well. Rapid onset of symptoms within minutes, okay? You need to suspect low blood sugar if the patient has a history of diabetes or is wearing a medical emergency information bracelet, tag, tattoo, whatever the case may be. If hypoglycemia is not diagnosed and corrected by rapid administration of glucose in some form, the patient may die. A person experiencing hypoglycemia may also appear to be drunk. So try to get the answers to the following questions. Are you a diabetic? Did you take your insulin today? Have you eaten today? If they've taken their insulin and they haven't eaten, they're going to be in trouble. Okay? There's no glucose for the insulin to take over to the cells. So it's robbing all of the glucose that it can out of the bloodstream and your sugar levels are getting lower and lower and lower because it's taking it off to the cells because you haven't added any sugar to it. And what happens is that your brain gets starved of sugar. Okay, because the insulin's taking whatever's left out of the bloodstream and that's the only way the brain gets it. The brain gets it through the bloodstream. If the patient is able to swallow, attempt him or her to eat or drink something sweet. Put in some sugar, take a glass of orange juice, dump a whole bunch of sugar in there, stir it up, and say, drink this. If they are conscious and they're able to swallow, have them drink something sweet. Now, they may also have glucose tabs, they may have you know, glucose paste, they may have all kinds of stuff that may be in their closet or in their purse. So you need to look around for it and ask them about it as well. There it is, there's glucose. Uh, this is lemon flavor and that's cherry flavor. Uh, if the patient is unconscious, open the patient's airway and assist breathing and circulation. Do not administer fluids by mouth if the patient may choke or aspirate. If they're unconscious, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna put anything in their mouth. The patient must have glucose administered intravenously as soon as possible. So we're actually going to put an IV in them and we're going to give them sugar, okay? Now some EMRs carry a tube of oral glucose gel or tablets that can be placed inside the patient's cheek. 
this figure here shows you that stuff. And what that is, is if the patient is still conscious and they can swallow, we can put it right inside the cheek and it'll absorb right through those tissues very, very quickly and hopefully turn them around. All right, so diabetic coma. This occurs when the body has had too much blood glucose and it doesn't have enough insulin. Okay, so it's got a lot of glucose in the bloodstream and not enough insulin to take it where it needs to go. These signs and symptoms include A, a history of diabetes, warm, dry skin, rapid pulse, deep, rapid breathing, and a fruity odor on the patient's breath. Does anybody ever chew Juicy Fruit Gum by Wrigley's Gum Making Company? I have. If you want to know what that fruity odor smells like, chew some of that gum. That's almost exactly how it smells. I can't tell you how many times I've smelled it before, and it smells like juicy fruit gum every single time I smell it. All right. Other signs and symptoms, weakness, nausea, vomiting, increased hunger, thirst, and urination. <clears throat> Usually this is a slow onset of symptoms. It's days before you get there. Misdiagnosis is very common because it's not always easy to distinguish between hypoglycemia and also diabetic coma. Okay. Administer a liquid substance that contains sugar. If they are conscious, if they are alert, okay, we need to work on that. All right, that's the problem. They've got too much insulin in there and it's taking all that sugar out of the bloodstream, whatever's left, and they just they can't keep up with it. Okay, they just don't have enough sugar in their body. All right, so here you go, comparing hypoglycemia to diabetic coma. Hypoglycemia, it shows you here, okay, what the deal is. It shows you diabetic coma over here, what the deal is here too. Primarily our biggest problems is not having enough sugar in the body, okay. Uh, it's not being appropriately managed, okay. It's not moving from one place to another. So we need to be sure that we manage that correctly. All right, so diabetic coma in general give conscious diabetic patients sugar by mouth and arrange for prompt transport. Again, we remember that this is usually more commonly where they took their insulin and they you know, haven't eaten anything. So we need to try to get some, some sugar in them. If the diabetic patient is unconscious, then arrange for, arrange for a prompt transport. All right, abdominal pain. The contents uh, of the abdomen are divided into hollow and solid structures. Hollow structures are really tubes through in which contents pass. Solid structures produce something. They do some kind of function. They produce something. The abdomen occupies a large part of the body and abdominal pain is a very common complaint. As an EMR, you need to recognize that a patient has abdominal problem but are not expected to determine what the cause of the abdominal pain is because it could be many, many different things and it's an internal issue. It's hard to understand and hard to recognize exactly what it is. All right, so acute abdomen, it is caused by an irritation of the abdominal wall. This irritation may be the result of infection or may be caused by the presence of blood in the abdominal cavity. Pain can be referred to other parts of the body as well. You can have pain in your abdomen and it radiates to your shoulder, okay? The abdomen may feel as hard as a board because they, they are tightening up their muscles so you don't push on it. These patients may have nausea and vomiting as well. They may also have fever, diarrhea, as well as their pain. Some patients with abdominal pain will vomit blood because they are bleeding from the esophagus or the stomach. Bleeding from the lower part of the gastrointestinal tract may produce bloody stool that contains a bright red blood or the stools may be very dark, black, or tarry kind of looking. These patients must be treated for shock. If a patient has abdominal pains, monitor their vital signs, treat symptoms of shock, and keep the patient comfortable. And of course, arrange for transport to an appropriate medical facility. All right, one cause of acute abdomen, or anytime we say acute, it means a sudden onset, is abdominal aortic aneurysm, or AAA. AAA occurs when one or more of the layers of the aorta become weakened and separate from the other layers of the aorta. 
Remember the aorta, it's attached to the top of the heart and it arches over and it goes all the way down your body and it branches off at the femoral arteries to go down and feed oxygenated blood to your lower extremities. Well, that's sometimes where we find this aneurysm that's somewhere below the heart, around the belly button, that kind of stuff, where it's, it's got a weakened layer there. So it starts separating from the other layers. So anyhow, that is what uh, aortic aneurysm. Now these patients who have diabetes, high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, as well as heavy smokers are at high risk for developing uh, a triple A. Patients may complain of pain, okay, like a tearing sensation in the abdomen and may have pain that refers to the shoulder. If a triple A ruptures, a patient will experience severe pain and profound shock. And they probably are going to die very quickly. All right, so treatment, what can we do? Place the patient in a comfortable position and treat for shock, keep them warm, keep them calm, handle these patients very gently, and arrange for prompt transport to the hospital. All right, kidney dialysis patients. All right, so people with certain types of kidney disease are unable to filter waste products from their bloodstream. Because remember the cells, they produce waste products that have to be eliminated through our kidneys, through our urine, okay? Many patients with chronic renal kidney failure, renal, which is kidney, failure undergo hemodialysis two or three times a week to remove this bad stuff. It, the patient blood passes through a machine in dialysis that filters out the waste products and returns the clean, uh, cleansed blood back to the patient. That's how dialysis works. Hemodialysis continued here. Um, they may have a shunt, these types of patients that it's implanted in their arm. A shunt is a surgically created connection between the artery and the vein. If a patient has a shunt, take his or her blood pressure in the arm without the shunt. This will avoid any damaging to that device. And you want to take it on the opposite arm. All right, patients may experience emergencies related to the dialysis treatment, usually low blood pressure due to the changes in their body, that kind of thing. Patients may experience that, that big drop in blood pressure when they first come off the machine. Uh, there may be a decrease in blood pressure that will produce shock itself. Uh, dialysis patients are also at risk for internal bleeding as well, as well as external bleeding when they remove the catheter out of the shunt. Um, so they also may have abnormal levels of electrolytes that can actually cause cardiac um, arrhythmias due to those balances. And all an arrhythmia means it's creating something that's wrong. You know, the heart beats at a regular rhythm and when they have bad electrolytes, you know, imbalances, it can cause it to be funny. Treat these symptoms presented by the patient and reassure them and make sure to arrange for proper transport. All right, so in summary of this chapter, okay, general medical conditions may have different causes, yet they do result in similar signs and symptoms. Our first responders who are skilled at recognizing the signs and symptoms of various general medical conditions and knowledge about general treatment guidelines will be able to provide immediate care for patients, even if they cannot determine the exact cause of the problems. That's okay. With a patient who has a general medical complaint, you need to follow that systematic patient assessment sequence. Usually it is best to collect a medical history using the sample format on a patient experiencing a medical problem before you perform a physical exam. Get that information first because if they fall unconscious, remember I told you, they fall unconscious, now you, you've wasted that valuable resource that you could have gotten before, especially that, that, you know, that sample history. Okay. All right, so altered mental status, AMS. It is a gradual decrease in level of responsiveness. When assessing AMS in a patient, use the APU scale. You should complete the patient assessment sequence to ensure scene safety and proper assessment. Uh, initial treatment seeks to maintain the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation and normal body temperature and to keep the patient from incurring any additional harm. If the patient is unconscious and has not sustained trauma, place the patient in a recovery position or use an airway adjunct to maintain an open airway. Seizures. Seizures are caused by a sudden episode of uncontrolled electrical impulses in the brain. Please do not forget that. That is a test question for sure. And usually the seizure will be over by the time you arrive at the scene. 
If it is not ended, focus on protecting the patient from injury. Do not restrain the patient's movement. And once the seizure has stopped, ensure that the patient has an open airway. You can then place the patient in a recovery position and arrange for transport to an appropriate medical facility. All right, some specific medical conditions typically encountered by the EMR include angina pectoris, heart attack, congestive heart failure, dyspnea, or shortness of breath, don't forget that word, stroke, hypoglycemia, diabetic coma, and abdominal pain. By learning the causes and knowing the signs and symptoms of these conditions, you may be able to provide more specific care for the patient. Although these conditions must be diagnosed and treated by a physician, you can greatly improve the patient's chances of survival by taking some simple actions until a more highly trained EMS personnel arrive on scene to assist you. All right, awesome stuff. Assessment time. You guys know what to do. Congratulations on completing this lecture. Go back to your JBL Navigate Dashboard for the assessment block. Open the chapter assessment for this lecture. Complete the assessment and submit. You may take the assessment as many times as you like, and you have to achieve 70% or higher cumulative score for each chapter. Thanks a lot. That's medical emergencies. Thank your participation in the program. We really hope that you continue your education. But until then, while we're learning, let's uh, make sure if you have any questions to email us at student at All right, folks, have a good afternoon and we'll see you next time.